Welcome to Grace's online service. I am so glad you're here. For those of you that don't know, my family and I live on a small farm outside of Ann Arbor, and one of the unexpected joys of living there is that we get a, a front row seat to the changing of the seasons. Just in the past two weeks, with all the rain and warm weather, the entire landscape turned from brown to green. And like in your neighborhood, people are starting to venture out from their long winter hibernation. We're all kind of squinting into the sun and you know, making sure joints and muscles still work. So we start thinking about spring cleaning projects, opening windows and cleaning cobwebs out of the corners. Now you've got to know I'm going to turn this into a spiritual metaphor. It's one I've used before and I'm going to use it again. So here it is. Spring doesn't just occur in nature and on our cleaning schedule. Our souls go through seasons of spring where we find hope and renewal and new signs of life. I believe God wants to do that work in your heart today. If you're short on hope, we're trying to bring something hopeful. If you're tired, we're trying to bring words of rest. And if you're feeling sluggish, we're just trying to put a little extra pep in your step. If we're successful, would you consider letting us know? You can send us an email of what God is doing in your life or find us on any social media platform except TikTok. We're not on TikTok yet, but everywhere else, reach out and let us know how God is bringing you into a season of spring. Now we've got a great service today with music and teaching and stories of God's goodness. But if you've appreciated the work we're doing here, if you've benefited from our weekly services and understand how much work goes into putting them together week in and week out, would you consider supporting us financially? The easiest way is to head to our website, gracechurch.city, and click on the Give link. There's lots of ways to give, and we work really hard to be responsible stewards of your generosity. For those of you who already give to Grace, wow, thank you so much. It allows us to show up on your phone or laptop each week to be creative and to keep the lights on around here. So like I said, we have a great service today. Let's take a deep breath together and get ready to sing along with our worship team as they lead us in song. Good morning, people of grace. Let's raise our voices and praise this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a
Here at Grace, we have three core values, worship, community, and mission. Our student ministry is committed to these same values, and it has been amazing to see our middle school and high school students embrace what God is doing. We've seen students learn what it means to have a personal relationship with God and take steps to grow in that relationship. We've seen students gathering together and forming meaningful relationships, both in person and online. But what has been most exciting to me is seeing students put their faith into practice as they actively participate in loving and serving our community. Some of our students have given up their afternoons to volunteer at a local food pantry. Others have stepped up to volunteer at a blood drive on one of their days off from school. We even had an event where our students came together just to put together care packages for Hope Clinic to distribute to those in need. The cool thing is that they didn't need to do any of these things, but they chose to partner with God and be His agents of change in their community. God is moving in and through these students, and it's been a joy to witness how these young people are changing the world one step at a time. If you're a student or if you know of a student that's looking to join a community of friends all growing and seeking God together, check us out on our website at the link in the description, or join us on a Sunday night at either Grace Canton or Grace West. We'd love to see you. Now, take a moment with me and prepare your hearts for worship as we dive into a new sermon series titled, what just happened? Good morning, my name is Zach Stamp. I'm the pastor at our Canton location, and I'm just thrilled that you have decided to worship with me and Grace Church this morning. Well, about five years ago, I received a phone call early in the morning from my friend, Scott. Now you need to know that, that Scott is just one of these energetic, excited, full of life kind of guys. And anytime I'd ever spoken with him on the phone, like, man, he was just full of energy and worship. But that morning when I answered his phone call, I didn't hear a voice that was full of energy, but rather I heard a voice that was full of devastation. See, Scott went on to explain to me that that night there had been a fire 
in his house and it had destroyed everything. Now, praise the Lord, his wife and his kids were able to get out just fine and, and, and they were unharmed, but the house had been completely destroyed. In fact, as I spoke with him on the phone, he was walking amongst the charred remains of his house, trying to salvage anything that he could from books to, to shoes, to clothing, to wedding dresses, and even photo albums, but nothing was salvageable. Everything had been destroyed. And sitting on the burnt remains of what used to be his sofa, Scott began to weep. And I'm not talking like a weep where you have like a gentle tear drip down your cheek. I'm talking about one of those violent, uh, heaving kind of weepings where it's snot filled and you're hyperventilating. He was weeping. And with this, a sense of stunned, shock, disbelief, he says, man, Zach, what is happening? I feel like my life has been turned upside down and shaken violently. What do I do now? Where do I go now? What? And sadly, for many of us this morning, we can relate to my friend Scott because we have experienced a violent shaking in our lives where we feel like our metaphorical houses have been burned to the ground and we are devastated. See, for some of us, our marriages have recently failed and our hearts have been forever seared with the pain and devastation that has come with that. For others of us, we've, we've lost our jobs or our, or our financial security has disappeared and we don't know how we're going to make ends meet and we are struggling. Still for others of us, we have recently received a very difficult diagnosis or maybe the loss of a loved one or maybe our dreams have been shattered and we are devastated. And as we sit amongst the burnt remains of our lives, we, like Scott, begin to wonder what just happened. Now, what do we do? Now, where do we go? Well, that's exactly what I want to talk about today as we kick off our new series called What Just Happened. And my prayer for us throughout this series is that we would see the resurrected Jesus intersect the good, the bad, and the ugly in our lives, and that we would see how he changes everything. So go ahead and grab your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 20. This morning, we're going to be camping out in verses 11 through 18. And while you're turning there, let me just uh, remind you that this is part of the resurrection narrative. That on Friday, Jesus uh, suffered, bled, and died and was buried in a tomb. And then just a few days later, we see that Mary Magdalene is coming to his tomb to anoint his body, which was a typical custom according to the Jewish tradition. And as she arrives, she sees the door of the tomb flung wide open. In other words, the stone that was covering the door has been rolled away. And she is stunned. She's shocked. She's in disbelief. She doesn't know what has happened. So she runs off to tell the other disciples about what's going on. And of course, uh, Peter and and John hear what's happening and they immediately bolt back to the tomb because they want to see things with their own eyes. and, And Mary follows them. And when they get to the tomb, Mary stands outside, but, but, but Peter and John go into the tomb to see things with their own eyes, to investigate. And what they see is that there is no body, that Jesus' body is no longer there, that the tomb is empty. And John even says in verse nine, he says, he and Peter didn't understand what was going on. So they left the tomb and they went back to their home. They went back to the room that they were at and Mary stayed at the tomb. And that's where we pick up the story this morning. Let's pick it up in verse 11. It says, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. So as she wept, she she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they put him. Now there is a lot of stuff that I'd like to talk about this this morning here in this text. But what I simply want to point out to us first and foremost is the posture that Mary is taking. See, in, in verse 11, we saw that Mary was standing outside the tomb. That her posture is to stand in the midst of the chaos. Now that is significant because in the 
original language, the word stand is used in what we call the pluperfect tense, which in grammar is basically saying she's standing with the strongest stance possible. In other words, this is the kind of stance where you can say, I'm not going anywhere. I will not be moved, which to me is absolutely fascinating because if you think about it, Jesus is dead. Her Messiah, her Savior is no longer there and she is confused and she is scared and she is sad and she is uncertain. If you may, her metaphorical house has been burned to the ground. She's devastated. Yet she stands. She does not waver from her confidence in Jesus. I mean, she, she's not like, well, crud, I guess that Messiah died. It's time to go look for another one. No, she stands. If, if anything, she digs her heels in deeper. Like she's saying, you can take his body, you can take his life, but you cannot take my hope that's in him. You cannot take my confidence. Now, let's be clear. Her confidence is not that Jesus is going to come back to life and save her because at this point, she doesn't know that's going to happen. She just knows Jesus is dead and his body is gone. So her confidence is more like a resolve. You know, that kind of resolve that says in the midst of the storm, when everything is burned to the ground and nothing makes sense, that kind of resolve says, yet I will stand. Man, that is powerful. That is powerful because more often than not, we don't do that, do we? The first sign of adversity, we're quick to bolt and run the other direction, right? We, we see this with sports all the time. As, as, as long as our team is doing great and they're undefeated, we're all in. We'll stand with them. But as soon as they, they, they lose a few games, man, we just bolt. Like we, we find another team to cheer for or we just move on to another sport. Same thing with relationships, right? When, when things get tough, it's just so easy for us to abandon things, to walk away and start swiping left or right again. We, we even see this with our jobs, right? Everything's going great, but then suddenly when, when things shift and they're, they're not going so great, we immediately start floating our, our resumes on Indeed or some kind of search engine. It's so easy for us at the first sign of adversity to do what Peter and John did, to go back to what is comfortable, to, to move. But that is not what Mary did. Mary stood. She was confused. She was scared. Again, her metaphorical house had been burned to the ground. She was devastated, yet she stood. Man, that is powerful. And here's why. Because when crisis and devastation strikes, and let me assure you, crisis and devastation will find us all. When that happens, we must know that where you place your confidence is where you will take your stand. Let me say that again. Where you place your confidence is where you will take your stand. If your confidence is in yourself and your abilities and your talents, when devastation strikes, you're going to try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you're just going to try to be your own Messiah. When devastation strikes, if, 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 if your confidence is in your money or your job, when, when a crisis arrives, you're going to pull out your wallet and you're just going to try to pay your way back to well-being. If your confidence is in uh, relationships or a significant other, when devastation strikes, you will turn to them to, to save you. And listen to me, you may have the resources, you may have the best talents, you may have the best friends in the world, but when devastation strikes, and it will strike us all, when the ground beneath us begins to shake, all of those things will crumble and drift away and we will fall. In fact, hasn't the pandemic taught us that lesson yet? See, sadly for many of us, our footing, our confidence, if you may, is in inadequate footings. So I think it's really important to ask yourself, where am I placing my confidence? In whom or in what will I take my stand? Because where you place your confidence is where you will take your stand. And Mary stood upon Christ even when none of it made sense, even when she didn't understand, even when devastation struck, she stood upon Jesus. Man, that's powerful. Let's continue the story in verses 14 through 18. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And yet she did not know that it was Jesus. 
And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, listen to this. He said, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. And Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them that I am ascending to my father and your father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Now, there are a lot of things I'd like to talk about here at this point in the story. But the first thing that I want us to notice is that everything begins to shift. It begins to pivot. It begins to change when Jesus calls Mary's name. See, throughout the Bible, we often see this occur frequently, that the, the God shows himself to people by calling them by name. For example, in Exodus chapter three, we see Moses at the burning bush, right? Like there's a bush burning, it's being cons- and it's, it's not being con- consumed, it's a miracle. And God doesn't show up in some other way. He simply shows up by saying, Moses, Moses, calls him by name. Same thing in 1 Samuel chapter three, we see Samuel hear the voice of God, the prophet Samuel hear the voice of God for the very first time. And when he does, God doesn't say thou shall or thou shall not. He simply says, Samuel, Samuel. He speaks his name. See, God calls our names, not so that we would know he is talking to us, but so that we would know who is talking to us. And this seems to be the same tactic that Jesus is using with Mary, right? Jesus says just one word to her, just one word. He says, Mary, he calls her by name. And don't miss this. Everything changed when Jesus called her name. Everything. She instantly identifies him. There's no more guessing. There's no more confusion. There's no Thomas-like moment where she says, show me the holes in your hand. There's none of that. Everything changes when she hears Jesus call her name. Her shattered dreams and her sorrow was instantly transformed into joy and celebration. It's no longer, what did they do with, with my Jesus's body? But now it's no, Jesus is here and he's calling me. He's calling my name. In fact, this makes me think of Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 where we see God speaking to the people of Israel. And look at what he says. He says, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have what? I have called you by name and you are mine. You are mine. And don't miss that. This isn't simply just about God getting Mary's attention or saying, hey, look, I'm alive. See, Jesus didn't reveal himself to Mary by telling her who he was, by by telling her who she was to him. You are Mary from Magdala and you are mine. You're mine. Man, let that sink in. When Jesus calls us by name, he is telling us who we are to him, that you are mine. Man, let that sink in deep into your bones so that you know with absolute clarity that you are not ultimately defined by your brokenness or your shattered dreams. No, you are his. That you're not ultimately defined by your failure or your mistakes. No, you are his. You're not defined by your sin or your shame or your guilt. No, you are his when he calls you by name. So let me ask you this question. And it's a simple question, but has profound impact. Do you hear him calling your name? Do you hear him crying out to you, saying your name? That in the midst of your desperation, when your metaphorical house is burned to the ground, do you hear him? Do you hear him say your name? In the midst of your fear and your frustrations and your misunderstandings, Do you hear him calling your name? In the midst of our devastation and struggles, do you hear him? In the midst of our sin and our shame and our guilt, do you hear him calling your name? Because hear me on this, everything changes when he calls your name. 
everything changes. He's alive and he's here and he's with you. And he says, you are mine. Everything changes when he calls your name. In fact, look at Mary's response. And we see her response in verses 16 and 17. Her, her instinct first and foremost is to call Jesus Rabboni, Rabbi, right? Now, you have to understand that, that, that this is not just a simple, hey, teacher, hey, prof, hey, rabbi, it's good to see you, right? Like this is not a formal um, uh, acknowledgement of Jesus, this is a personal uh, sign or showing of her affections because this word Rabboni in the original language means my dearest, my dearest, favorite, most personal rabbi. Don't miss this. This is Mary's way of showing her deepest affections for Jesus. That when he calls her name, her response is to show her affections to him my dearest, most personal, my dearly beloved rabbi. And then you see in verse 17 that her instinct, her instinct at first is to then embrace Jesus. It's to move in for this big hug, to embrace her Lord, to embrace her Rabboni, to show her affections to Jesus. Which is really interesting because in verse 17, Jesus seemingly rebukes her for doing this, right? He says, don't cling to me, don't cling to me. Which if you're honest is a little weird because throughout most of the, the New Testament, we see, just, we see Jesus calling people to him. Come to me, welcome me and embrace me, follow me. But here he seems to say, stay away from me, don't touch me, don't cling to me. So is he, is he contradicting himself? What's going on here? Listen, he's not contradicting himself. See, when he says, don't cling to me, he's not saying, stay away, you've, you've got cooties, or you're not wearing a mask, or, or I'm not a hugger, right? He's not saying, stay away for those purposes, but rather he's reorienting her attention to something bigger going on. See, ultimately, he wants her to see that her desire to cling will ultimately necessitate the need to go, to go and tell everybody that Jesus is alive. So to be clear, he's not rebuking her embrace. He's not rebuking her affections or her desire to show him uh, her, her affections or to worship him, but rather he is reorienting her to the necessity for him to ascend to the father and for her to go and tell the disciples and everybody else that Jesus is alive. That said, I love that upon hearing Jesus call her name, Mary's instinct was to embrace Jesus. It's to stand upon him. It's to show him her affections. It's to worship him. See, when Jesus calls us by name, he seems to be telling us who we are to him. And in a similar way, how we embrace Jesus demonstrates what he means to us. If you may, it's, it's a portrait of our value, of our devotion, of our surrender to him. Now, honestly, it kind of makes me think of my kids. See, every time I come home at the end of the day, open the door, close it, my kids hear me come home and they rush to me because they want to show me their affections. And as they approach me, they wrap their, their, their arms around me and they give me this big bear hug and they squeeze me as tight as they can saying, Daddy, I love you. And they just hold on tight and I end up sort of walking in to the house with these two kids hanging on my legs and hear me, I love every second of it. I love it because my kids are showing me their affections for me. They're telling me that I love them. It's awesome. But imagine with me for a moment that they don't do that. Imagine instead they approach me and they give me one of those like sh light shoulder tap hugs. You know, that kind of hug where you don't actually hug someone. You just sort of awkwardly touch their shoulders, which if we're completely honest, doesn't make us feel loved. It kind of leaves us kind of feeling weirded out and kind of gross. I mean, what if they came up and approached me that way? How would I feel? Or better yet, what if they approached me and gave me a side hug? And we all know what the side hug is because that's like the famous church hug, right? It's the hug without really hugging somebody. What, what, how would I feel if they approached me and side hugged me? Or even better yet, what if they approached me and they fist bumped me or they shook my hand? 
which if we're completely honest, is sort of the culturally appropriate, um, obligatory way of acknowledging someone's presence. How would I feel? How would I feel if that's how they approached me to show their affections to me? And, and, and let's be clear, they can acknowledge my presence by doing those things. And they can even say that, hey, I value you. But there seems to be a big difference between that and the warm embrace. One seems so distant and unengaged and the other fully embraced and fully all in. And sadly, isn't this how so many of us show our affections to Jesus? He dies for our sins on the cross and we're like fist bump. He gives his life for us, sheds his blood for us and we're like side hug. He calls our name and changes everything and we're like, light shoulder tap. Man, that is deeply convicting to me because for for Mary, there was no side hug or fist bump or light shoulder tap. When she hears Jesus call her name, it changes everything and she is moved to worship. She is moved to embrace her dearly beloved Rabboni. And then faithfully and obediently, she releases him and then goes and goes and tells everybody that he is alive. So hear me on this. Wherever you're at this morning, whatever you're going through, for some of us, we are hearing him call our name this morning. In the midst of our devastation, in the midst of our metaphorical houses burning to the ground, we're hearing him call out our name. In the midst of loss or hurt or, or anything we're going through, for some of us this morning, we are hearing him call our name. Even for, for, for others of us, life is great. Like, like things are going great or, or, or maybe we're just sort of going through the motions. But nonetheless, for some of us, we are hearing him call our name this morning. The question is, is how will you respond when Jesus calls your name? How will you respond? Will you respond with a side hug? Will you respond by fist bumping Jesus? or maybe by giving him that awkward shoulder tap. My prayer is that each of us, that we would respond to the Jesus who calls us by name, by embracing him, by standing with him, and by not going anywhere. Because hear me on this, everything changes when Jesus calls us by name. My prayer is that it would lead us to embrace him and to worship him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, there are some of us this morning that are experiencing just absolute devastation from loss. God, others of us have watched our dreams be shattered and and we're at the end of our rope. Still others of us are experiencing the, the shackling weight of shame and guilt that comes as a result of our sin. Father, wherever we find ourselves this morning in the silence of this very moment, may we hear you call our name. God, call out to us in the midst of all the noise, the confusion, the fear, and the hurt. Call us to yourself. And may your reassuring voice reorient us not to our struggles and and our difficulty, but to our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose voice changes everything. And it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Well, for some of us this morning, we have heard the reassuring voice of God call out to us right here, right now. And if you've heard him call out your name this morning, we wanna come alongside you in prayer. So I encourage you to click the prayer button on the chat screen and let us know what's happening. And then we will pray over you. And may each of us in closing receive this benediction. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest and abide upon each of you. May he bless you and keep you, letting his face shine upon you. And may he bring us peace and confidence in his name. Amen. Praise God from whom Be the church.